Welcome back to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton. I'm Ollie Hayes and today I'm joined by Matt Slater from The Athletic to talk all things Everton Takeover, where we're up to with various consortiums coming in to take over Everton and just basically to put all our Evertonians' minds at ease and get a proper insight as to where all this all this talk of a takeover is going. Matt, how are you doing? I'm all right, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I think a lot of Evertonians are... Uh, you know, a little bit excited with all the takeover news, but also they kind of just want to know, you know, where we're up to in terms of what what parties are in to to take us over and stuff like that. So, what better way than to get your insight? And we might as well start with the the Bell and Downing partners um, mm. and how they're they're looking to take over Everton. Sort of, can you give us an insight as to to where they're up to with you know you know the, the backing of MS Dell as well? I think a lot of you know there's been a lot of speculation around them. So, sort of, can we just get an insight of where they're up to in, in terms of taking over Everton? Yeah, well, look, I um, I should probably stress here that, of course, everyone has signed NDA, so it's not like these people are, are, are speaking freely. Mm. Um, so um, everything I say and everything Evertonians read, right, has been has been filtered uh, through people. Um, so that's I think important to to stress. Um, Andy Bell and George Downing, I I. I think it's probably wrong to sort of think of front runners, but they are certainly advanced, um, mainly because, well, there's a few reasons, but they have a sort of existing relationship with Mashiri in that they uh, are part of another consortium, which we'll probably get onto, another mm-hmm. group, that, uh, that lent Everton 158 million quid last year. Yeah, They're, of course, lifelong Evertonians, um, successful businessmen, um, in their own right, um, they know what they're doing. They're very well advised. You know, good lawyers. They've done the due diligence. They 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 are very credible, and would have absolutely no problems in terms of Premier League owners and directors test um, or borrowing money. Really, frankly, okay, okay. which I think is important. I think there has been some misreporting or maybe some misunderstanding around Michael Dell um, now. Um, I mean, what I do football takeovers. It's kind of my job, and maybe sometimes I assume too much knowledge. Maybe I, I should, maybe I made a mistake. I should have made this clearer in some of yeah. our reporting. But I think some of the other reporting has, has sort of has has done a little bit of googling and gone Michael Dell, who's a, who's the, of course the man behind Dell Computers, uh, you know, a, a, a billionaire, several times over. Michael Dell has absolutely no interest in any sports teams. That's not what this is about. Um, I'm going to use some terms here, and I'll try and explain as I go along. So MSD Partners, which is his initials, uh, yeah. is, a, is, is what is known as a family office. Now, very rich people have family offices. They, have, they're they kind of like little mini investment firms that manage that rich person's wealth, with the idea being they're going to hand it over, right? So you, oh, know, okay. you start well, – they make their money in one thing. You start shoveling – that money into basically a, a family investment firm so that you can hand it over, you know, generation oh, okay. after generation after generation. Now, uh, that's what MSD partners are. Um, they actually, they're, they're, they're quite a quite an interesting family office. They, they actually now operate a bit like a private equity firm. So they're actually not just investing his money, Dell money, they're investing other people's money too. Um, okay. And then they then they sort of further moved away, if you like, from being a regular family office about a year or so ago. They merged with a merchant bank called BDT. So they are now BDT MSD Partners. They are a private equity firm. There's a lot of Dell money in there, but they, it's you know, Michael Dell is not. Is, he doesn't really. He's not pouring over what they do. He's not kind of really directing him them. And they have for the last few years, among other things. Um, Really got into lending money to football clubs, English football clubs. Right, okay. Um, and off the top of my head, I think they've they've lent money to about half a dozen. Um, yeah, I think it was like Burnley, Derby. I think yeah. West Brom were in there as well. I, th- I yeah. read in your article. So, so Burnley was an interesting one. You know, they basically you know helped refinance that that takeover there, that leverage buyout there. Derby, they were significant lenders on the stadium. They had a, they made it, they had a big say in how Derby exited. Um, administration West Brom is a really interesting one that's just happened um, so that sale so so MSD were West Brom's biggest lender and again oh, okay. they had a big say in how that one played out um, they've lent to West Ham Southampton so so 
so look, they um they're big into lending money, right? And now that's that's what they're interested in. They can't therefore take stakes in clubs. Right. Okay. Okay, so remember that. And then the other thing to remember about them, I think this may be a bit more positive, is they don't want clubs to go bust, right? For two really yeah. obvious reasons. One, they're interested in interest payments. So that, you know, clubs going bust is not not yeah, good. Yeah. Not good for business. But also they don't want it to look like they're bad lenders or aggressive lenders. They're not, they're not in the in the business of closing clubs down. So so I can almost sort of tell you one bit of bad news. Michael Dell is not riding to the rescue to buy Everton. But the good news is MSD partners are actually quite good lenders. They've got yeah. quite a good track record. Um, you know, the, the interest rates are, are higher than, than you know, you might choose to pay. Mm. Um, but we can get onto that as well in a bit. Yeah. Um, but they are, you know, good, patient lenders. And if they think that Everton Football Club can tolerate, can, 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 can borrow an amount of money and pay it back, then that means they're confident that Everton can do it. Yeah. So, so it's. I think Bell and Downing, as I say, have got sort of an existing relationship. They've got existing money in the club. So some of this is about protecting that. You know, they don't want to lose that money. They think. I think they're. They. they I think they're kind of reluctant a little bit. I think they're sort of one that don't forget. There's a bit of passion there. There's a bit of love. Yeah. So they, yeah. Don't want, they don't want their club to die, but they also don't want to lose their money. So I think they mm. think this is the best way to sort of protect that money, protect their club. Um. So I think they are, they are going to have to put some more money in, some more equity, some more mm. cash. I suspect they would be interested in hearing from other people as well that might want yeah. to join them. So that's all. That's, that's often happens. That that shouldn't we shouldn't be surprised if we if we hear and read about that. But underpinning what they do will be a big loan secured on the stadium. Oh, that's yeah. That's probably the, pay the, off the biggest other, worry. Isn't off it? The, yeah, to pay off to pay off the other. The other existing debt holders, of which there are many, well, not many, yeah. but there are significant ones. I think with with MSD, I think as you said, they don't they want to sort of protect their own images because I think a lot of Everton fans that were you know worried with the whole seven 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 thing. I think that it was very like it felt like the vultures were circling, and it felt like it was a club that were almost down and out in terms of finance uh, in terms of their financial situation. Seven 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 felt like a sort of, a, as you said, an aggressive lender, a, a lender that would come in and sort of, you know, wouldn't be right for the club, only right for their own pocket. So I think that's one thing that Everton fans are probably a little bit wary about is, is in terms of maybe seeing like vultures circling. But I think what you say, I think MSD probably wouldn't lend to to Everton if they didn't, if they weren't confident that they would get the money back. So I think exactly. that's probably one positive behind Bell and Darling yeah. is because one, they've got as you said, they've got the best interest of the club at heart because they are lifelong Evertonians, as you said. And I think as well, it, it, it sort of creates, a, as you said, a good backbone with with MSD partners because they've got that money there you know, to, to lend to Everton and, and they wouldn't lend if they weren't confident that they weren't going to get that money back. So I think that's a... Yeah. Obviously, as you said, you don't want to say that they're, they're furthest forward in the line. You know, they're, they're not furthest ahead in terms of getting this takeover done, but, you know, they, they look to be probably one of the most credible ones in terms of... Yeah, you know, that's a good for, way for the it. fan base. They they yeah. know exactly what the fan base want in terms Credible, of you know, the with, two, with a, a plan that makes sense, uh, with an existing relationship with Mashiri, uh, well advised, um, and, and I think you know I think it's fair to say they they're confident. Mm. I think that's that's good to hear as well because it's obviously we know that they've been sort of in the frame for quite a while, but they've always been sort of you know. Stay, staying off to, to the side obviously the, the whole exclusivity with 777 that took its yeah. toll you know, on the club massively and they, they were still there in the picture of course but I think there's there's obviously other you know firms and there's other consortiums that we've got to get onto and, and look at them yeah. because obviously it, it, it is still an open race in terms of who's going to get this takeover done and I think you know is is it fair to say that MSP may be a next down the line or is there is there other um, people in the wing? <clears throat> well I think MSP are definitely worth mentioning at, at this point. Whether, whether I'm saying they're first, second, third, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think they are also very reluctant and, and you know, potential owners of, of a club. Um, I think there's always been question marks around, you know, exactly who and what MSP are. So they are a sort of sports investment firm run by a guy called name uh, uh, James Najafi, who's a you know a, an Iranian American businessman. Um, used to own a chunk of the Phoenix Suns, made some money when the Phoenix Suns were 
were sold, uh, has invested in in in, in some football teams. Um, his partner's a is a was a pretty prominent sports agent. They they are part of the group with Bell and Downing that that made this loan, and about a year or so ago had a kind of pathway to ownership at Everton. Uh, it was quite a complicated deal it involved, um, you know, sort of preferred debt, which is, 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 is basically a loan that can be converted into into shares at some point. Um, I don't know how much ancient history we need to go over, but that, that deal didn't get over the line, mainly because Rights and Media, uh, who is Everton's biggest lender still, uh, mm. didn't like the deal. Right, okay. um, and and had and had a had a right within their loan agreement to kind of uh, say yay or nay to to changes of control and 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 I think we're concerned that two things really that um, MSP weren't putting enough money on the table and I think they were you know a little bit concerned about that but I also think they maybe were worried that MSP were getting a you know too too good a deal um, but anyway. Um, that is sort of ancient history now. Um, I, I get the impression that that MSP have been gently persuaded by Mashiri to put a deal together. Now, MSP would have lots of relationships with wealthy Americans, um, and they would also be able to borrow money. Though it's quite interesting, actually, you can sort of see what MSP are doing. You can you can look at SEC filings, and there is actually no evidence I can see that they've actually been in the market trying to raise money. So I think any deal that they are proposing with Mashiri is very much on paper at the moment. Um, and it's always been a little bit unclear to me exactly how wealthy Najafi is, how much money he, he made on, for example, the Phoenix Suns and some of his other investments. So I think what they would be proposing would be very much a sort of syndicate type approach, which is actually pretty common now. So the most famous example would be Fenway Sports Group in Liverpool, yeah, which is yeah. a, you know, 15, 20, 25 wealthy people that come in and out at times. Um, you know, there are other clubs that have taken this approach. It It, it is, it is um, you know, a perfectly understandable way of doing it because we're talking about very, very expensive um, companies that people are buying here so and it spreads the risk and brings in you know different bits of expertise as well so i i don't know all the detail with msp i think i think they have been almost sort of gently persuaded to yeah. to join the fray as a way of protecting their existing position um i'm led to believe in that in, in that no one's really been able to explain it to me so it kind of makes sense that their proposal is complicated and again it will be yeah. another combination of equity and debt so so that's all I, I can really say about them, because the other thing about them is that they have just not engaged with the media at all okay. for about 18 months. Right. From, the, from the moment they withdrew or they were sort of blocked from taking over the club in, in stages, it was a staged yeah. process. They were originally going to buy 25% of the club with a view to getting more down the line. Right. Um, from that moment, they've stopped talking. Right. Okay. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's I MSP. Think, I, I was going to say, I think for Evertonians, that probably poses a little bit of a risk in terms of our mind because Triple Seven were very similar to that. They've kept very tight lips throughout the whole process of the the fit and proper test over the you know the well well well, well they, well they have and they haven't right. So they have publicly. Um, yeah. You know, there was a few LinkedIn posts from from Josh Wander, wasn't there? Talking. Yeah, there's more than that. They've had, they've had they've had plenty to say. You know, they've had plenty to say. Lots of journals have had ways to speak to Triple Seven through the right, process. Okay. So don't so they've had plenty to say. Okay. Fair enough. I, I think as well with MSP, I think that they, they are obviously similar to the the Bell and Downing thing in terms of they probably yeah. would have better interests for the club at heart. Obviously, you know, Bell and Downing do have uh, links to MSP. So I think that would sort of translate yeah. into that as well. So that's not obviously it's not the most negative of takeovers ever. No, it's it's an unusual one though that that Bell and Downing and MSP appear to be, you know, acting against each other here. There's there's no indication of any major falling out. I'm guessing a little bit here. I, I suspect Bell and Downing may have been a bit um, frustrated at times that MSP um, 
were a bit more on the front foot because the whole triple seven thing, you know, just the fact they went on so long is just insane and and, mm. and reflects very poorly on machinery. But MSP have had the ability to take control of this process for about two months, right, okay. um, because they as as their security is mainly on the stadium development company, but they also had um, security on fifty one percent of the shares in Everton. You know, oh, right. personally for Mashiri. So the mm. minute that Triple Seven, um, um, well, basically Mashiri, but he wanted the Triple Seven to do it to pay back MSP, which I think was early April, um, and then extended it to the end of the season. Um, MSP could have taken control of the club, could have taken control of the process. Yeah. Now that, of course, would have meant they would have been funding Everton to the end of the mm. season, and they and they would have been, you know, the ones answering these tough questions and mm. you know dealing with the Premier League and everything else. So they chose not to, and I and I right, and I okay. do wonder if the fact that Bell and Downing are now appear to be acting alone mm. is 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 a sort of result of a difference of, of opinion about how to proceed. Right, yeah, I think as well. It's it's obviously it's not just exclusive to Bell and Downing that MSP is there. There's obviously other consortiums in the mix, and in terms of uh, you know different consortiums led by different businessmen. I, I was reading in your article as well that you said that um, Bachim Manukian um, yes. had, had led a consortium, uh, a London-based yeah. businessman, and he'd made yeah. a bid of all equity, four hundred million uh, pounds for Everton. Yeah, I think. Well, look, there's there's that... a lot. <laughs> There are a lot of questions about this. So, yeah, he he um he's the sort of latest name to throw into the mix. Um, he's claiming that his group uh, has made a bid, right? So there you go. We we have we we actually have a solid bid that they have they've admitted to. They've they've yeah. they've announced. Um, there are a lot of questions uh, about the bid. Okay, so that's fine. That they want to stress that they think they have four hundred million quid together, great, but that doesn't address everything right is that is that the mm-hmm. offer is it the offer to who to, to Mahishiri to the existing debt holders because mm-hmm. there is about 600 million best part 580 million of secured debt there so uh, are people accepting less if so who who are they choosing to take out who are they extending um so there's a lot of questions still to be answered really about that bid and then uh we don't know all the detail of the group it's great that they've announced the the man who's fronting it Interesting character. He's um, he's he's a forty five year old businessman based in based in London. His family are really interesting. I'm sure Everton fans have already been googling the Manukian family. Um, they're from Lebanon, but originally from Armenia. His uncle Bob Manukian was a big player in the eighties and nineties. Owned a bank, property mm. developer, serious wealth. You know, I think they've made a lot of money, lost a lot of money. Yeah, you know, that's just the nature of these things. Um, had an interesting falling out with the Sultan of Brunei. Um, but all this stuff you can find, right? Now, yeah. um, Vachki is his is his nephew and um, trained lawyer, um, joined a tech fund in London um, last year, I think, or maybe the beginning of this year. So look, you know, he's, he's you know, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, a savvy he's a, businessman. He knows what he's doing. Well, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. He comes from money. Yeah. He's a trained lawyer. Who knows if he's any good at business or not? But he is at least the person that you can find, and and he exists and he's real. Yeah. And he has, a, he has, you know, he'll have some sort of track record. We know his family have had serious wealth. You know, you, you know, they, they were the sort of people that were listed in the Sunday Times rich list. You know, a decade or so ago. I think it's quite hard sometimes to track um, wealth like that over a period, um, and also where it is. You know mm. where it is geographically, how how accessible it is, how liquid they are. I think yeah. those are sort of genuine questions to ask. They've also sort of talked about in the group. Um, I think some of the others have have already reported this. I I you know I didn't because I didn't have a chance to sort of properly interrogate it when I heard about them for the first time. And that's that they have a Saudi prince. Great, right, sounds okay. amazing. I don't want to be dismissive of Saudi princes, but there are literally thousands of them. Um, Saudi royal family is enormous. Yeah, don't forget Sheffield United are owned by a Saudi prince mm. who isn't very who isn't very wealthy, and they've been for sold for sale sorry for a couple of years, and he's really struggling to get that club sold. So can sound amazing, 
doesn't always uh, translate into um, you know winning the lottery uh, in terms of football. Um, I think people say, say the Newcastle you, project, don't they? And, but, and they're yeah, like, well, that, oh, well, that, well that's the Saudi prince Zero you want, Zero. right? There's, there, yeah. there are Saudi princes and there are Saudi princes. Mm. And um, I would argue that um, the fact that Newcastle are owned by the main man means that I, I would I would wonder how high up the pecking order this this Saudi you know Everton's potential Saudi prince is because yeah um, you very rarely want to go up against um, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, so anyway, that's that's just a, an aside. But anyway, they have they have a group. They have a group, yeah. and um, I think they I think the the bigger stuff they need to answer is the structure of the deal. So that what I was saying really about existing mm. debt holders, mm. who who they're paying off, are they paying them off one hundred percent, or again to a negotiation with them where they have to accept less? Are they going to just say okay, we'll park you for a bit? You know, do you agree to wait? Mm. I extend your loan, defer all interest. These are the sort of key bits. So, so I think the key, the key stuff. It's really interesting to go through the runners and riders, and we, and we have. Mm. I think the bits that Evertonians perhaps aren't not well. From what I'm reading, perhaps aren't quite grasping is. And there's no, no reason why you, they should, because yeah, yeah. it only really, I, you know, I, I go from fan base to fan base to fan base with takeovers, and it's always the same. You scratch everyone the surface, sort of, don't you? It, well, everyone has this idea. Sort of... Everyone has this idea that, like, well, what's my club worth? Mm. And it's it's very rarely what people are actually willing to pay for mm. them. All right, sometimes more, sometimes less. You know, valuing football clubs is really, really difficult. It is an art, not science. Um, and um, it, it's just there. There is no like set formula. So that's the first thing. The second thing is most buyers, nearly all buyers, to be honest, don't think in terms of like what it costs to buy the shares. They think in terms of what is known as enterprise value. Now, your enterprise value is the price of your shares, the cost of your shares. Right? We can do that. That's easy. That's easy to get your head around. And your net debt. Okay. So really, Ever Everton, um, I'm sorry to say this, have been in this situation for a while, really, where the shares are worth about a pound because the net debt is so enormous. Yeah. Now, if you include Mashiri's shareholder loans, it's a billion, right? Now, no one's yeah. paying a billion for Everton. I'm sorry. You know, amazing. You could have you could have the greatest stadium in the world, and it it could be open now, and yeah. you know. But no one is no one's really treating Bashiri's four hundred and fifty million as genuine debt. It's yeah, sort of yeah. equity that he's gonna to have to write off yeah, straight away. Yeah. There might be some tax implications for that. So that's there's there's some potential complexity there. But so let's let's forget that and let's really more think about, you know, the six hundred million or so of net debt, which is the rights of media, triple seven, MSP, and a tiny bit to Metro. Right, there's some there's some transfer stuff coming and going as well, but let's just think about it. Six hundred. So that there's that. There's the amount to finish on the stadium, which again, you know, we we don't know because Everton aren't doing a running commentary. But I think the best guess is 70, 80 million or so to go. I think it's under yeah. the hundred mark now. Okay, that's good. Right, that's so we're positive, getting closer. Yeah. So I think we should add that to the mm. to the potential price set to the enterprise value, and then. You know, Everton are a loss-making club. You know, there, there is that's what that's that's what Triple Seven have been doing for the last year. You know, paying for yeah. the stadium, but also paying for the running costs. You know, mm. the, the the monthly shortfall, if you like. Now that's coming down because, as every yeah. Everton will know and point out, well, you haven't been spending as much. You know, a lot mm. of players um, just went out on the end of contracts. So your amortization bill, which is like your annual transfer yeah, bill, yeah. just how they count it, has been falling. Your wage bill is falling. But you're still you're still losing money. So yeah. So there's an amount to sort of recapitalize the business to kind of pick things up. So that's what you suddenly get into sort of 750, 800, depends who you talk to. Now that that is at the upper upper limit of what most people think Everton are worth, and Definitely, that is an Everton yeah. that is an Everton that is kind of solid. You know that is that is, is Premier League position is safe. The stadium is open. So that that's the top end now. Now, nearly everyone I 
speak to and i and i as i say i do this for a living so i'm constantly talking to people about what's mm-hmm. for sale what's not for sale how much do you think yeah. that's worth you know brentford are, are kind of for sale there's a big chunk of west ham for sale yeah um, ipswich have just gone through watford are for sale there's loads of clubs right for sale any one time there's loads of clubs spurs of course are for sale they yeah I admit it but they are so mm-hmm. you've got different price points and, and where do everton sit in that and and are they are they the most attractive if, of, of purchases? Well, I don't think they are. I, I, I well, genuinely don't well, think they are. Well, that's it. And I think sometimes you just have to be kind of a little bit honest about where you are and how people view you. Not how you view you, the fan. I love my club, you know, the fan base, the history. Mm. That's that's not how buyers not like, dispassionately thinks, yeah. are, look, are looking at it and going, look, I've got a lot of choice. You know, I love English football. I can sort of see that it's a growing business. Or maybe they don't even love it at all. Maybe it's just purely business, right? I can sort of see that football is this sort of, all right, okay, and I need to be there. And which, so what have I got? More bit and more Spurs, London, great, amazing stadium, mm. NFL, oh, Taylor Swift. Oh, oh, but that's a bit, I can't afford that. Do I go for, do I go for a Watford? You know, do I go for a, oh, no, I'm not sure about that. You know, a bit small. Mm. Uh, can I, can I, fit, can I fall something more in the middle? Is that yeah. where Everton are? But then you'd be looking, are Everton a safer bet than Brentford at the moment? Are they a safer bet than West Ham? Again, with the London addresses for both those places. Yeah. West Ham with their amazing sweetheart deal on that stadium, mm. just hosted baseball. So these are the sort of things that kind of people think about. And you're like, okay, Everton, I can see a lot of debt there. I've got to tidy that mm. up. Okay, so those are downsides potentially. However, all right, maybe it's an upside because maybe – they're all sitting there thinking, I'm going to lose my money here. I'm going to lose my shirt. Maybe I can go in and say, guys, right, you can have 50%. You're secured. You can have 50%. Triple seven, I'm sorry. You're, you're junior to those guys. You can have 25% to go away mm-hmm. now. All right. So maybe I could, maybe uh, someone can, can, can do deals and can suddenly put together a package that finishes the stadium, put some money in, in, the, in the club's coffers for 550, 600. Well, suddenly Everton are, go from being a problem to being, oh, well, wait a minute. That that might be the best. Mm. That might be the best. Yeah, yeah. The, the best like way yeah. to go forward, yeah. So this, so I've been trying to explain this in my pieces that there's there there's a there's a sort of there's a there's a universe there's a, there, where where Everton are just a problem. Mm. And it's like, oh my God, how do we get through this? There's, there's no good options. But then there's another universe where it's like everyone sort of realizes that people have made mistakes. There's a lot. Of, so this is kind of like a sort of honesty moment, right? Mashiri's got to be honest and, and and his role in this. But equally, the lenders, right? They've all they've all enjoyed the high interest rates because Everton are a bit of a distressed asset. But sometimes you have to accept that maybe you shouldn't have lent them that much money. Yeah. And maybe it was a mistake. It's the, there's an old adage in business, like if um, you know if someone owes you a hundred pounds, it's their problem, but if they owe a million pounds, it's your problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So rights and media, who we don't talk about very often, because who yeah. the hell are they? But equally, you know, triple seven for sure. But MSP, you all lent this club a lot of money. Yeah, and maybe your position isn't as secure and as amazing as you think it is. Yeah, okay, you've got security on the stadium, but how much is that really worth if Everton go bust? You have an amazing building in Liverpool with 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 what in it? There's, there's going to be nothing to, to fill it. There's, it's yeah. obviously it's built as obviously a purpose built football stadium. Exactly. There's no football club to put in it. It's, yeah. it's you know it's it's it's, it's a worthless. football factory. You own, you own a football factory that doesn't make mm. anything anymore. So look, so look, these are all the sort of you know the worst case scenarios. But I think we've got to a point now, and I do think this is there's a sort of it's more positive in that everyone I think now is realizing ah. Oh, we need a way out of this. All right. Sean Dyche and guys and co have done their bit. We we are still a Premier League team. We can then start to sort of think about a future where we remain a Premier League team and maybe you can actually start to compete again. But we all have to sort of accept our role in how the last few years have played, played out. The stadium is, I think the stadium is interesting as well because it's sort of gone from being a pitcher to something real to something very nearly open. So that helps. Yeah. 
I think uh, obviously the, the the stadium is obviously a blessing because it's the state of the art modern stadium that Everton, Everton are going to move into. It's going to bring so much more match day revenue in years to come. But it's also a kind of a curse because it's like it's casting such a shadow over these negotiations for taking over the club. And obviously, you talk about um, in your piece as well. You talk about the the presence of John Texter and, and Dan Friedkin, and obviously yeah. John Texter is definitely a name that's looking at um, getting rid of his share in Crystal Palace. And obviously, he would not be able yeah. to take over Everton until he until he did that. No. Um, how solid are, are Friedkin and Texter in terms of taking over Everton? Obviously, two American businessmen. Uh, yeah. they've they've built multi-club groups themselves mm-hmm. how solid are they in terms of putting to put forward a, a takeover bid for Everton okay well I'll, I'll try and deal with those quicker I mean I've no, well I've known Texter for a while you know I, I broke his when he bought yeah. Bristol Palace and um and have, and have covered his his adventures in football frankly um He's not going to buy Everton, I'm afraid. I I I put a very very small percentage. Never say never, right? It's, mm. it's it's more than zero chance, but I think it's very very unlikely. I think he's actually been a little bit played. So Mashiri, his interest is to drive up interest, right? Is to create an auction. Yeah. Um. So that's why we're getting a lot of leaks at the moment about every conversation he's having. Fine. Right. They. It's going to happen, isn't it? It's, of course it's it is. All right, of course it is. And, um, you know, I think Texter is, is a very accessible guy and I think he kind of sort of walked into this a bit. Is that, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true that he's interested. He's mm. looked and he's had conversations, detailed conversations with Mysterious Associates and um, he spoke to us about it on the record. There you go. That's the sort of guy he is. Um He's not in a position to buy Everton. One, for the reason you've outlined, he owns 45% of Crystal Palace. He's been trying to sell that state for a while. Um, he's in a bit of a tough spot there because no one wants 45% of a club. He only has 25% of the say. Um, he really, really is an evangelist for multi-club stuff. Now, that's a whole different podcast. His 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 group's done okay. Botafogo have started the... They, did, they almost won it last year in Brazil. Last season, they've started this season pretty well. Leon, after a really poor start, turned it around and qualified for Europe, made the French yeah. Cup. You know, he's he can point to some success that there, you know, mm. there are some signs. And of course, Crystal Palace finished the season well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Molenbeek, his other team didn't do so well; they got relegated. But um, they're the smallest of the of the four. But he's in a, he's in a tough spot um, at Palace. He, he you know, he. he He's a, he's a man on a bit of a mission, and, he, and no one pays attention to him there. Mm. So that so that's that's that, and and he has a high valuation for Palace. You know, like like in my previous answer, he values his stake very high, and okay. uh, no no one is offering him what he wants. Right, so they're offering yeah. him about half. So really, needs to sell that stake. The most obvious people are the other shareholders. They're all lowballing him, so he's stuck. Yeah. Now the other thing about Texter is that, and again, he's been very open about this, he wants to float Eagle Football, his group. So there is always a little bit of um, um, self-publicity with John as well, John Sexter as well. Um, You know, of course he wants a Premier League club. Mm. Of course he does, because that would look amazing in the portfolio and people would be buying into that. And he wants to list it on the New York Stock Exchange. You know, Palace isn't isn't quite working for him. Mm. And he, uh, you know, he's thinking, he's looking around, right? But it's just not yeah. going to work. It's not going to work. Um, now, Freakin is a is a, is a, another really interesting guy. He's he's very committed at, at Roma, and there's a big long term project there. They've got issues, you know, around sort of stadiums and all sorts there. Um, he's just bought a, a much smaller club in in France, fourth tier AS Can, um, mm. and um, you know, I think he's you know he is genuinely interested in the multi club model, like a lot of these American investors are. Yeah. I get the impression that. Um, Everton is being passed around the sort of the, the papers that the, they call them sales decks, and a lot of people are looking. And I'm actually surprised we actually haven't had more names. I think I think that, enough, yeah. wouldn't surprise wouldn't surprise me if 25, 30 um, brokers agents haven't looked at Everton and tried to see if any of their existing clients, anyone they've ever done any business with, is interested. Um, I would put freaking in that camp. I don't yeah. think. I would be surprised, 
put it that way. I, th- I think it's that he's got a bit more chance than Texter in that he has more freedom to do it. I just would be very surprised if he did because Roma are sort of his number one. Priority. The pride and joy of his of his sort of portfolio. Yeah, and I just think it'd be very difficult for him to sort of take on another difficult project. Yeah, I, I think I think with that, it's it's kind of obviously I I we've talked about so many times that the the personal point of view and and sort of the personal bias of an Evertonian it, it kind of obviously excites you in one hand because you've got that multi club model. It's you see so many times you, you look at the Red Bull model for example. So many times you see different links between the clubs. You know, you look at Leipzig, Salzburg, the players moving between them. I think with a team like Roma, that definitely brings some excitement for Evertonians. But also, you know, Roma are without a doubt a bigger club than Everton. They're, they're much higher up their respective league than Everton. They're probably going to be the prior, priority over us at the moment. So I think it, it's a double-edged sword in that sense with free, free Kim because it one, it brings, yeah. you know, potential but also it, it it brings potential for failure because you you're not the pride and joy of, of the portfolio no. and you're not no the, one wants to be number two in a multi no. group you want to be top not. Of yeah hundred percent but listen it, it's going to be an interesting couple of weeks isn't it in terms of our our takeover and in terms of what's going to happen um, but that's all yeah. we've got time for today on the Toffee Blues uh, make sure you like comment subscribe thank you so much today for coming on Matt we really appreciate it obviously all all us Everton fans are, are worried about what's going to go on in the next couple no, of weeks but of course. But it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see who comes through the, I think the process that's, look, and takes us over. I think the news is better, right? The news is better than it was a month or so ago. It's still a mess, but I think it's a, it's a different mess, and I think it's a better mess. All right, And I think there is some optimism. I do hear genuine optimism, whereas, honestly, a few months ago, I, I only heard bad. So that's that's positive to hear, isn't it? Obviously, you know the 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 couple of years we've had in terms of finances, we we get to the point where we're just sick and tired of hearing about financial fair play and potential issues with debt and stuff like that. So I think yeah. you know it, it's positive to hear from you know a journalist like yourself that the insight that you have got is positive and you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. So yeah, it's, so. it's going to be an interesting few weeks. But yeah, honestly, thank you so much today for coming on, Matt. We really appreciate it, and obviously, I think you've put a lot of Evertonians' mind at rest there in, in terms of the takeover process. I hope so.